Okie dokie. Um, we're gonna start like we will start most of our classes by going over the warm up. All right. Um, again, I'll mention again, these are not worth much for your overall grade, but they are a, a little signpost to you if you need to like dig into the material a little deep more deeply. So like if you are getting, you know, 50% on these, that means that you need to understand this material at a deeper level. And again, this is reviewing the stuff that we are going to be building on as we go on. So I can't emphasize enough that if you are having trouble with these foundational concepts, you need to proactively go and review, um, get clear on all these basic things around chemistry, around diffusion, osmosis, osmolarity, um, things like that. Uh, Okie dokie. This one most, most people got 84%. This is a classic example of a metabolic pathway. In fact, this is one we're going to look at in quite a bit of detail next week. This is like the Krebs cycle that's happening in the mitochondria as part of cellular respiration. Um, what do we call each of these compounds that's made along the way as you go from one step to another in a metabolic pathway? Intermediate compound. Those are the intermediates. And then there is going to be some kind of an enzyme. In fact, here, this thing written, actually, I don't have, this is the name of the compounds. Um, this is implying that there is going to be some enzyme that is making the reaction go from one intermediate to the next. Um, in this picture, it doesn't say them specifically. Sometimes when you look at a picture of a metabolic pathway, they'll actually have a little arrow zipping in and out, um, which is the enzyme that's driving that step. Um, describe the function of enzymes. Um, so this is actually a, looking at how people answer this. It's kind of a good thing to discuss just kind of what I expect, you know, when I ask this kind of question on the tests where the, ant, the points matter more. Um, you know, when I function of enzyme, what is, what are the core function? What is, what do enzymes do? It's an organic they, catalyst. Speeds up a chemical reaction in the body. Up. So saying it's an organic catalyst is one thing, but then I still want to know what is it doing and what is a catalyst doing? You know, giving it a name catalyst is just giving it another name. What I want to know is, you know, it's speeding up reactions or you know, lowering the activation energy so the reactions can go faster. Um, and then defining properties. What are defining properties of, of enzymes or catalysts in general? It's shape. You know, activation site. So that is important. It's important that it has a particular active site that combined with a substrate. Um, what are other, another, like when I say catalyst it's, or enzyme, what are the two main things that? They are they are protein, it's no, organic. Um, more about it speeds up reactions and it's not consumed in that process. So that's an important part about the definition, defining property of an enzyme. It's speeding up a reaction, but it's also unchanged after, you know, throughout the process. Um, other things, you know, about them having a spe special shape, that is going to be important. Um, but when I think about defining properties of an enzyme or a catalyst in general, it's speeding up reactions and is not being consumed. Um, this one, again, 84%, one mole. Again, if you are one of the people who got this wrong, please go back and look at moles. Um, we're going to be using moles and molarity as our main way of specifying concentration for the whole semester. So it's important that moles make sense. Again, one mole does not weigh the same as a mole of another element. One mole is the same number of atoms or molecules. So like a mole of helium floats, a mole of lead sinks to the bottom of the sea. 
right? It's going to be six times 10 to the 23rd atoms or molecules of some stuff. It's a way to specify an amount of stuff, kind of like a dozen is an amount of eggs, right? Something like that. Um, when the concentration of hydrogen ions in a solution increases, again, most people got this pH will go down. Things become, it's just more or less acidic. More acidic. More acidic. So like I mentioned last class as well, make sure you get this straight. And again, it can be a little confusing, like some things go up, some things go down. Make sure that it's kind of all clear exactly how pH and hydrogen ion concentration and acidity or alkalinity are all related to each other and how they move with respect to each other. Um, when specifying a solution of sodium chloride dissolved in water, here only like 60% of the people got this right. Um, and this is going to be really important uh, as we go on. So if you were one of the four out of 10 people who got this wrong, this is something you really got to go back and figure out how this works. Um, and what happens when you take sodium chloride and you put you put one sodium chloride in water what happens to it it dissolves into two particles oh, so it disassociates disassociates or, yeah it disassociates sorry so in those those two words can it, they sound similar but they're different dissolves means it goes into solution but then dissociates is something beyond that not only does the molecule go into solution but dissociating means it breaks apart into separate pieces so a separate independent sodium ion and a separate independent chlorine ion, which then act as two separate particles with respect to osmosis and osmolarity. So what's going to happen if we have like two molar NaCl solution, what's the osmolarity going to be? Four. Be four. It's going to be double. Whatever the number of moles you got, you're going to have twice as many particles because every NaCl becomes two particles. So please go back and review this if this is confusing. And we're going to be looking at this again and again and again. And it's going to come up in lots of contexts. So please make sure this makes sense. And again, if, you, if it's not making sense, there's office hours. There's your textbook. There's stuff on the web. There's lots of resources, but you need to be proactive. This is not a class where you kind of just, oh, I got to get to that. Or it's like, oh, I'm not quite sure. And then let's just hope I get the next thing because that's how you slip beneath the waves and just leave little bubbles on the surface instead of getting an A in the class. Can I ask a quick question about this? Sure. Um, so I did, I, I got the question correct. And I'm, I definitely understand how like the ionic um, compounds are disassociating so you're getting the more particles the total number of particles is going to be greater than just the molarity um i don't know if i just can't wrap my brain around this right now because i haven't had enough caffeine but is the, what's the like is there a direct math trick is it yeah. just going to be the sorry go well, ahead it was that i remember i was showing you that dimensional analysis when we looked at doing the, yeah so if i if i have you know let's say i have Let's make it even weirder, 2.5 molar NaCl. And I want to know what is the osmolarity. I just have to remember the definitions. Molarity is going to be moles of a particular solute per liter. Right. Whereas <laughs> osmolarity is going to be moles total of particles number. per liter. Yeah, total number. I right? need to come up with some way to end up with moles of particles on the top instead of the moles of, in here the solute is NaCl. So if, just by definition, this is 2.5 moles of NaCl per liter. I need to come up with a conversion factor to change that numerator into particles. So 
dimensional analysis, you just come up with what is the kind of unity operator? What is that thing that's equivalent on the top and bottom? I'm gonna need moles of NaCl on the bottom because I need them to cancel, so that's gonna disappear. And I wanna have moles of particles on the top. And then I think about, okay, every mole of NaCl becomes how many moles of particles? Two. Yeah. Two. So then I just multiply on through. The moles of NaCl disappear. I end up with two times two. This is going to be five moles of particles per liter, which is the same as five osmolar. Right. No, I, I'm totally tracking what you're saying. I'm just kind of wondering if there's a way to like shortcut the math a little bit in terms of like like just looking at the compounded me like okay can I just make it, like say it was NaCl followed by a bunch of other elements I don't know something hypothetical but you can look at it and break it down and be like this is how many of each element there is in this compound so I just need to multiply that by the molarity kind of without setting up the so, does that make sense all right so if you know however many this thing breaks into you're just going to multiply the molarity by that number Okay, great. That's all I was just trying to ask. I was just wondering if I had to break it out every time or if I could kind of like look at it and just do it that way quickly. Right. If you think about it, think about this. It's basically this factor here is just how many particles per each individual molecule. So if it doesn't break up, if we had 2.5 molar glucose, what would I end up with? 2.5, same thing, because it's not going to just... Yeah, glu one glucose molecule is one particle, so it's just times one, so it still stays the same, 2.5 osmolar. If I had calcium chloride, which we saw in our lab, what does this break into? Three. 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 Yeah, it's going to be calcium plus two Cl minuses, so that's going to be, if this was 2.5 molar calcium chloride, it would be 7.5 molar. Okay, I'm tracking you. I just wanted to kind of see if I could do that math shortcut and it sounds like I, 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 I got it. Okay, thank yeah. you. So however many particles it breaks into, you'd multiply that times the molarity and that will give you the osmolarity. Yeah, I think the shortcut is just knowing what dissociates and what doesn't. Right. So that, that you need to kind of have a better sense of the periodic table. The, if you have things that are coming out of either the first or second column that only have one or two electrons in their valence shell are more likely to ionize and they're hanging out with like one of these halogens, something on the end of the other, on the right side of the periodic table that wants to just grab one more electron to fill its valence shell, it's likely to be an ionically bonded thing that's going to break apart. Um, so again, and sometimes, sometimes the ions aren't individual atoms. Like I talked about, you know, carbonic acid. You know, this is carbonic acid, which we're going to see quite a bit in the class. And this dissociates you know, reversibly into H plus plus HCO3 minus. So this is kind of a polyatomic ion. This is a bicarbonate ion. So an ion isn't necessarily a single atom that's charged. It can also be a kind of polyatomic little thing that's got a net charge. So carbonic acid. Oh, does that, that make it a little clear? Okay. So, um, just to remind everybody, next class is in person. Just to, so you don't forget, you know, at Kent Field. So you have to get a bright, yeah, bright-eyed and bushy-tailed and get in your car and head on over to College of Marin. Um, you know, the, our, our lecture is actually up on the second floor um, and then the lab, although 
I guess we should probably do that to give the lab tech a chance to set things up. So we'll have like a lecture upstairs and then we'll do the um, lab downstairs in 114. Um, you have a quiz on Tuesday. You're gonna need a Scantron form. So the Scantron form is kind of the kind of classic 50. It's, it's you know, let me get green because it's kind of greenish. It has 50 questions per side. Um, most, I'd be shocked if you haven't seen one of these before. Um, you can buy them in packets of like, you want, in fact, buy them in a bulk, like at least, you're gonna need at least like six in this class, so. Actually, I've never seen them before. And um, can you get them at the bookstore? Absolutely. Okay. Yeah, David, there's a couple different Scantrons. Um, this is like the thin, you, you want us to get the one that's like a half page wide with no extra room for handwritten answers, yeah, there's, right? There's a particular, oh, I forget which one it's like, if, I don't know, does anybody have one just lying around so they can read the- I'll, I'll find one, I've got one. You can go grab one. Okay. Thank there's you. a number like SE442 or something. I forget exactly what, you know, it's, it's a pretty standard one and they, you can buy them in like six packs for like a dollar 50 or something. Oh yeah, so Ross. This one, right? Here, hold, can you, um, here, I'm gonna. It's. Um, here, I'm gonna pin Ross here so everybody can. It's number 882E. Yeah, can you, can you show it to everybody? Yeah, so that thing right there. All right, Did everybody see that? You get you get like you get like six or seven or six or eight in a pack. All right, awesome. Thank you very much. All right, now I have to figure out how to unpin you. So you're um, move pin. All right, now we're back. Okay. So with that being said. Um, we still are not done with chemistry review because we have to go through the basic types of molecules. Um, bio, so what am I trying? So one of the things I, I do know like that chemistry for like nursing majors is kind of a weird class. It's trying to teach general chemistry organic chemistry, some parts of biochemistry, which should be taking about a year and a half to do in all in like, like a few months. I took it last semester and I find it, I found it to be very unhelpful. It's, it's, it's not a very, it's, it's a class designed so people can get through fast, but in reality, I find the people who actually take general chemistry like take 114 or something and then just get the other parts, you know, later tend to actually have a much easier time because they're just have a much better grounding in chemistry, right? Rather than like drink from a fire hose and like not really get much of anything, the people who start with just general chemistry actually, oh, I see what's going on here. So it's, yeah, I mean, it's something we've talked about on the kind of teacher side a bunch is that it's, it's a really impractical class. It's like theoretically, theoretically, like people had like a nice idea by creating it, but nobody who teaches it actually thinks it's a very practical class to teach in reality. So, but you still need to know this stuff. So that's why we're reviewing it now. And you do need to, you do need to make sure you do know this stuff. So let's, talk about basic kinds of biomolecules, which I introduced last time. There were carbohydrates, 
lipids, proteins, nucleic acids. These are kind of the main types of organic. Organic molecules just means carbon containing. So if a molecule has carbon in it, it's an organic molecule. Um, doesn't necessarily mean it's from something organic. It just means it's carbon. Um, a lot, in fact, most of the molecules that we are going to be hanging out with this semester fall into one of these classes. So it's important to actually have a basic idea of what these are. Um, what the kind of classic kind of representative molecules are within these different classes, what are the basic characteristics of molecules that fall into these different classes, things like that. So we're going to look at each of these in turn and go a little more into detail on them. So let's do it. Let's like start with carbohydrates. So carbohydrates, they have carbon, hydrogen, and oxygen, and the ratio is always going to be one to two to one. I think that's the, the way they got their name originally even was because when people were studying this stuff and they realized even before they knew what the actual structure and bonding structure of these things were they realized they had this ratio so it's like kind of carbon and h2o so it's like carbo and hydro water they're not really carbon and water but that's kind of how their name came into being because they have their carbon and their hydrogen and oxygen in this ratio um the simplest ones of these are called monosaccharides also called simple sugars. Um, these are going to be things like, you know, C6H1206, which we've been talking about, which is known as? Glucose. It's glucose. glucose. Although, depending on how you um, connect those, those different atoms, you can have the exact same chemical formula be fructose. It just looks a little different. Or it can be galactose um, or different ones. So there are different, this would be what we call a hexose sugar. Because hex, six hexagram. So it has six carbons. Um, there are also you know, pentose sugars. but it would be C5H10O5. The same ratio, but it's got five carbons instead of six. Um, does anybody know a classic example of a pentose sugar that's super important in your body? Ribose. Ribose. And deoxyribose. Right, those are like deoxyribo, that's deoxyribonucleic acid. That's like in the backbone of DNA. Ribose is in the backbone of RNA. So these are pentose sugars. Um, so we're obviously gonna be seeing a lot of carbo, these monosaccharides specifically, we're gonna be seeing glucose a bunch um, because it's the main fuel in cellular respiration. Um, then you can take more than one monosaccharide. If you take two monosaccharides and connect them together, you get a disaccharide. So 
So disaccharide, um, and I should mention like a, a glucose, when you look at a glucose, these are carbons at each here, there's obviously gonna be another carbon here. Let's see that exactly, it's something like this. Um, so this would be like a, a glucose. Looks kind of like this. They go into this little ring form when you put them in water. Um, this is one, if I take two glucoses together, so these are the ring. These are supposed to be two monosaccharides. If I have two monosaccharides and I have a disaccharide, if I have a glucose with a glucose, this is called a maltose. Maltose is just two glucoses bonded together. If I have a glucose plus a fructose, what does that give us? Sucrose. That's sucrose. Sucrose is important because it's one of the main transport sugars in plants. So that's where we're getting a lot of our carbohydrate from in our diet is by eating these plants that have sucrose in them. And then once we have that in our body, we can break them apart. We got a glucose and we can transform fructose simply into a glucose. So we got fuel for cellular respiration. Um, another disaccharide that shows up a lot is glucose plus galactose. Which becomes lactose or milk sugar. So lactose or sucrose or maltose, these are all disaccharides. They're made out of two monosaccharides that come together. Um, this is a good time as any to give you a little bit more um, vernacular that shows up sometimes. People talk about hydrolysis and dehydration synthesis. So um, so for instance, if I have, um, this is just the hydroxyl hanging off of some simple sugars. When I'm gonna connect them together to make a disaccharide, they're gonna come together, have one oxygen left linking them, which means there's an O and two H's that had to disappear. So in assembling these two monosaccharides to make this disaccharide, sometimes they call it like dehydration synthesis. You know, synthesis, because you're putting them together, dehydration, because you're losing a water, so, you know, losing a water dehydrating. Um, when you're gonna take this thing and break it apart, then we have to add a water in. So if I wanna break apart my disaccharide, I have to add a water. And then I can make two separate things again. That's gonna be called hydrolysis. When you see this word hydrolysis, it sounds like it's water lysis is to cut apart. So you have, to add a, you have to add a water in and you end up breaking the thing apart. So this word hydrolysis shows up a lot when you're breaking things apart. It's just because it requires a water added into the equation in order to um, as assemble the two products there. So you know, you've, I'm sure you've heard this word hydrolysis, but, but this kind of gives you more of a background of why that word makes sense if you if you didn't know. Um, all right, so we talked about monosaccharides. Disaccharides. And then the last um, category here is gonna be polysaccharides.
which is what just was, what was that opposite reaction called not the dehydration synthesis but when they get broken apart hydrolysis hydrolysis yeah so polysaccharides when you have lots of simple sugars connected in big long chains like i might have just a whole bunch of glucoses Was a polysaccharide just anything larger than two glucoses? Um, yeah, and usually they're much bigger. Usually they are, they're big long chains. What do we call a bunch of glucoses connected up in a big long snake like this? Polysaccharide. So this is a type of polysaccharide, but this specific starch. one, this is starch. Um, you know, this is the main storage carbohydrate in plants, right? This is, and this is also important in human physiology because this is how you're getting a lot of your carbohydrates in your diet. There is some plant that is storing away energy for a rainy day. Maybe it's a potato plant or uh, whatever, or a, a, um, a, a wheat plant that's storing away some energy for its little embryo to grow with the new seed or whatever. So plants are making starch to store energy so they have it for later, but then we rip them up and we kill them and cook them and we eat them and then we got the starch. And then we can go in and we can use enzymes to break apart the little bonds in between and free up the glucoses. And now we got lots of glucose for our cellular respiration. So starch is a classic polysaccharide. Um, a couple of other polysaccharides you need to know. So like I said, there's starch which is basically a bunch of glucoses. Um, in animals, you have a similar thing, but instead of being more linear, you have it in a more branching. <coughs> so we have what's called glycogen. It's the same basic idea, but it's kind of more branched. These are still all glucoses. Sometimes this is called animal starch. Your body stores away lots of this in your liver so you can easily free up glucoses if your blood sugar is going low. You have lots of glycogen granules in your, particularly your fast twitch muscle cells so they can free up glucose really quickly if you're trying to sprint away from something. Um, so glycogen is like starch. It's a storage carbohydrate, but it's usually found in animals. That's how we store our carbohydrates is as glycogen. So, but whenever you think of glycogen, it's just a whole bunch of glucoses connected together in big, long networks and with bonds that are easy to break. So you can easily free these up and then use the glucose. And then the last one we're going to sure. put here is cellulose. Cellulose is like starch, but it's got a different kind of bond between the sugars. So I'll like maybe do it with like a little jiggle or something. And it's, usually, and it's also kind of more tightly wound into each other. So these are still glucose. But these bonds, different bond. We can't break. Right, so 
animals like us do not have the enzyme that can break that bond between the glucoses. So this cellulose, and examples of cellulose would be like wood. When you think about wood, most of the um, structural carbohydrates of a plant are cellulose. So if you think, what is cellulose? Like, you know, your desktop is made out of cellulose. Um, this is like the roughage or the fiber in your diet because you eat this and it goes through your digestive tract and ends up down in your colon because you can't break apart these bonds to get the energy. You know, if you were a cow, there, there are other organisms that can. There's a lot of bacteria and protozoans and stuff that do have the enzyme that can break apart, right? Obviously there's energy, right? There's lots of energy stored in this. Those glucoses have lots of energy stored in them. If you take a log of wood and put it on your fireplace, it's gonna burn and warm you up and everything. You can release the energy easily by lighting it on fire. It's just, we don't have the enzymes to break it down in our digestive tract. So um, if you are a ruminant, like a cow, for instance, or a deer or some other animal, they have, more specialized systems where they have multiple stomachs, right? They will chew up their grass or whatever and swallow it. For us, we would not get a lot of energy from eating grass, but they eat the grass, they swallow it, and then it goes into like a stomach that's full of these bacteria that can break down these bonds. And then they regurgitate it. That's where they ruminate, ruminants. They chew it up again, chew in their cud, and then they swallow it back down and bring it down back where it can continue digesting after the little bacteria down in their digestive, their other stomachs kind of did this fermentation, broke down the initial, whoops, I didn't mean to write anything there, right? There are other things like rabbits and rats have a similar thing. Like if you've ever had a pet rabbit or something and you think it's eating its poop, it's not at all. It's actually swallowing its food. It's got bacteria down in the lower parts of its digestive tract that are breaking apart the cellulose. And then there are these pellets that are half digested by the bacteria. And then they eat those and then they can actually extract the nutrients from them because the bacteria have started the process already. So. Don't gross, get grossed out if you see a bunny eating its poop. It's not actually eating its poop. It's eating the partially digested cellulose that is part of its normal uh, process of getting, getting nutrients. Um, so anyway, so cellulose, we'll talk more about cellulose in detail um, when we get to the digestive tract, um, but cellulose, is the fiber or roughage in your digestive tract that kind of forms the bulk of your food, which is kind of important to keep things moving, right? So, all right. so, so no animals have the enzyme, but some animals have a bacteria that can break down the, the cellulose. cellulose. Exactly. Yeah. So all the ruminants, again, like cows and deer and things like that. Um, even insects, like termites, a termite is an animal, right? Insects are animals. They can't actually eat wood on their own. So they eat the wood and bring it down and they have all these symbiotic protozoans in their gut that then break apart the cellulose and free up the sugars. So the termite gets energy from it, right? If the termite did not have its, its symbiotic protozoans, it would not get very far eating wood. So any questions about polysaccharides or disaccharides or monosaccharides? Just kind of an off the wall question. Uh, dogs can't break down cellulose, right? No. Is there a reason they eat grass? Um, I think it's to, it's my cats do it too. I think it's to kind of help them like kind of vomit or kind of, I think it's kind of self-medicating. Like when they're feeling, feeling like, their tummy is off, they eat grass, and then they kind of, that, that's my sense of it. Got it, sorry, very off the wall question. 
And I, I don't know the details. And they might get some some nutrients from it too. You know, we we get some nutrients from eating leaves, but we we can't extract a whole lot of energy from them. Like if you wanted to just eat leaves and have enough energy to live your life, you would have trouble. But there are there are nutrients and things we can get from them for sure. You know. All righty. So let us continue. So there's a question in the Questions. chat. Why are we encouraged to eat leafy greens if we can't right. digest it? Right. So you can't break down the cellulose, but there are other nutrients and stuff in oh. there that you're getting as well. Right. And also I our own micro microbes in our digestive tract feed off of cellulose as well. Right. That's part of the gas. Like when you yeah. like are, yeah, I mean, why do you beans, beans, the magical fruit, the more you eat, the more you toot, like the more of that fiber you're getting down into your lower digestive tract, the more those bacteria are breaking it down and making gas, which then is getting released. So it's like the old lady who swallowed the fly and then you have to swallow the spider so that that organism can eat the other organism. <laughs> you know that nursery rhyme? I mean, I know that mm. I'm, I'm not. If that doesn't make sense to anybody else. <laughs> oh, I got gotcha. you. I'm right there with you. Yeah. Same. Right. Yeah. And yeah, I guess a cautionary tale, don't swallow a horse or you're going to die. So, all right. Um, let's go. Maybe let's do proteins. So proteins. Proteins are kind of there. We talked about these make up the enzymes that are helping speed up your chemical reactions. A lot of them are also structural, right? Protein is collagen. It's making up all of the organic part of your bones and all of your connective tissues like ligaments and tendons and cartilage and things like that. Um, it's also gonna be like, you know, in membranes for many functions that we're gonna see. And we're gonna see proteins that are transport proteins that control what goes in and out of a cell. Proteins that are the receptors that recognize when there are messages coming into the cell. Um, we're gonna see proteins playing many different roles. So it is gonna be really important to understand proteins at a deeper level. And what is the building block of a protein? Amino acids. Yeah, so these are basically made up of amino acids. So to understand proteins, we have to start by understanding what is an amino acid. Then we can start connecting the amino acids together to make proteins. So an amino acid looks kind of like doesn't kind of it looks like this. So this is an amino acid. Um, it's called an amino acid because it's got an amino group. Carboxyl is an acid. So every amino acid has one end be a little amino group, one side being a carboxyl. Um, the side chain is what makes different amino acids different. You know, in our body, there are 20 naturally occurring amino acids. Um, there are lots more, um, but if you just wanna make up all the different proteins that make up a human being, it's 20 of them. 20 to make proteins in the human body. You know, and each of those 20 are distinguished by having a different kind of side chain. And depending on the side chain, this amino acid will have different kind of chemical properties. Some side chains are, if I only you get my, my eraser thing. Let me give myself a little more room here.
you know, some are nonpolar. Some are polar. Some make ionic bonds. So different amino acids like to participate in different kinds of chemical attractions and bonding. That's going to be really important as we continue on realizing that each amino acid has very different chemical properties. When we try to understand how membrane proteins even just stay in the membrane, this has to make sense. If you want to understand what it means when serotonin or LSD binds onto a receptor on a neuron, you've got to understand this. We have to understand different amino acids like to do different kinds of chemical interactions. So the building block of a protein is amino acids, and there are different types of amino acids that like to do different kinds of chemical interactions. So now what we're gonna do is we're gonna take the amino acid, we're gonna start connecting them together. You basically connect the amino group, amino side of one to the carboxyl side of the other, it's called a peptide bond, and we start connecting them together. An amino acid and to another amino acid, to another amino acid, to another amino acid. These are called peptide bonds. And again, you said you join the, uh, to make the peptide bond, it's the joining of the high. It's the amino and the carboxyl ends. So this is what we're gonna call the primary structure of a protein. is just the order of amino acids. You know, which ones is connected to which and what order? What determines the primary structure of a protein? This, I the know. The sequence of amino acids? Say it again. The order of the amino acids, the how, side, side how, cups or side. How is that defined, though? How how does the cell know which amino acid to hook up to which RNA? Uh, so the, this is that code. Remember, this is I know everybody who's been in biology one ten has done this lab where you take little pieces of felt that represent the different amino acids, each three letter, each three codons, or each each codon, which is three nucleotide bases specify a different amino acid. So you have you know, the code in your DNA. Your DNA inside the nucleus of your cell has all the blueprints to make these proteins. And you take that blueprint, you make a copy in the messenger RNA and bring it up to the ribosome where you can then use the transfer RNA to bring the appropriate amino acid into the assembly line next. So again, this is stuff I know you've seen in Bio 110. So this is just defined by the um, blueprint that is in the DNA. Um, right, there, there's post, post um, after you do the initial copying, there's editing of the introns and this and that, but for the most part, you know, this is just a blueprint in the DNA gives you the order of the amino acids to connect up. Um, but this is just the first part. Amino acids connected up in a big long snake is not a functional protein yet. Um, and I should also mention this word peptide. If, um, if less than 100 amino acids, often called peptide rather than protein. So there's a lot of important molecules that are peptides. Like a lot of your hormones, like insulin is 37 amino acids connected together. 
and it would be called like a peptide rather than a protein or a lot of other hormones actually some of the hormones that are important are only like seven or eight amino acids um, they'd be called a peptide rather than a protein all right so we have primary structure which is just which amino acid is connected up in a big long chain Next, these are going to start assembling into, there's two main possibilities for what we call secondary structure. A common thing that happens is it starts creating this helix. Basically, you get hydrogen bonding between every third amino acid. One, two, three, one, two, three. So basically every third amino acid kind of hydrogen bonds with the one above it in this thing. And this is called an alpha helix. This is an alpha if you don't know what an alpha is. So that is a very common secondary structure where this snake will start curling into a spring basically and it gets held together in that form by hydrogen bonds between amino acids. Um, another common kind of secondary structure are these big kind of sheets. They're called beta pleated sheets. Where you get big hydrogen bonding that kind of stabilize it more in these big flat folds. This is called a beta pleated sheet. So this is important to realize that as this thing starts folding up, two common things that happen is either it coils up into like a helix or it lays out in these kind of flat sheets against itself. And again, this is kind of stabilized with with hydrogen bonds that are pulling one amino acid to another. Um, this did is, you say, I'm sorry, did you say every third amino acid, yeah, hydrogen the, bonds to it, each yeah, other? Yeah. And for, that's for how the, it makes it, okay. Yeah, for the heli alpha helix, yes. Oh, so it's not the same, it's not every third amino acid for the beta pleated sheet, No, just, just, the, just the helix. Right, because the beta, if it was every third, then the beta pleated sheet would be the helix. It would pull itself into a helix. So, so this is still not a functional protein. So next we're going to go to the tertiary structure. Which one's not um, a protein? Both the alpha and the beta are not yet a protein. Yeah, yeah none of this is a protein yet. But none of this is a functional protein. So now we're going to go to the tertiary structure. So this is where you get kind of more complex folding. You often have alpha helices and beta pleated sheets. And here you also have kind of hydrophobic, hydrophilic interactions with the surrounding water. And so this is more complex folding. At this point, this is where many proteins are now functional. A lot of enzymes are going to be tertiary structure of, of, you know, so the protein had its amino acids, which are all hooked up in order. Then we have alpha helices and beta pleated sheets. And then they just fold into this big complicated tangle. And, and it's not just, I shouldn't say tangle, it's a very um, specific shape that it goes into that's important for its function. 
Um, you can also see now why having pH going off is going to mess up a, an enzyme, right? If I have more H pluses out here, the charge out here is going to be really different. That's going to be pushing or pulling on this thing and changing the way this whole thing is sitting and folding and mess up the shape. And if the shape gets messed up, then it's not going to bind its substrate anymore. Um, so tertiary structure is where you start getting more of this folding and more complicated structures. And we're going to see this in a lot of detail when we look specifically at like receptors in the membrane and stuff. You'll see um, some specific examples of this. Um, there are some proteins that actually need more than one subpart to be functional. So there's also optional, I'll say optional, we call quaternary structure. This is two or more tertiary um, subunits for functional protein. So two or more tertiary subunits. So for instance, hemoglobin. Hemoglobin is going to require four of these globin subunits. Um, myosin is going to have these heavy chains and light chains. Um, Antibodies have multiple subparts, heavy chains and light chains. So there are a lot of very important proteins that we will be um, spending time with in the semester that are quaternary structure proteins, meaning they have two or more of these tertiary subunits to make a functional protein. So, is that the shorthand of just how to write when you're talking about different levels of um, protein folding? The little four with the kind of like yeah. degree? It's like fourth degree is the yeah, quaternary okay. or fourth degree or tertiary, third degree, um, secondary, second degree, primary, first degree. Something like that. Yeah, so that's just a typical, typical shorthand. Um, any questions about that? Right. And, and proteins can get, they can be more globby. They can sometimes they become more fibrous. You know, so they're not all like a ball of yarn. Some of them, some of them tend to assemble in kind of more fibrous structures. Um, particularly the ones that are more structural. Some of them tend to form more kind of glooped up balls. So let me, let me get rid of these so this isn't making me confused here. So proteins, and we should talk a little bit more about the idea of denaturing. So the word denature means it loses its shape. Um, what kind of things can cause a protein to denature? Heat. So what is heat? Um, if you think about, you know, this picture I drew here of this protein that's all this intricate folding, and you start adding more and more energy. The heat means everything's jiggling, jiggling, jiggling. Before you know it, everything's all tangled in on itself irrevocably. Like think about you know, a, a big string that's so tangled, there's no way you're ever gonna untangle it again. That's one way you can denature proteins is heat because things get all entangled and they lose the ability to keep their proper form anymore. Um, what other things can denature a protein? Acid. So pH, acid or base. 
If the pH is getting more extreme, it's going to cause things to um, fold weird and eventually lose their shape. Or sometimes even parts of it break apart. Um, what other things can cause? In fact, think about heat is how you denature, like a classic example of um, heat denaturing a protein is cooking an egg white. You know, egg white is albumin, you know, and it usually looks kind of like snot if it's just kind of the albumin sitting there. But if you heat it up, all those albumin molecules all get intertangled with each other and become a big white solid block, which is a cooked egg white. That's because all of those albumin proteins have all got tangled up with each other. You're never going to pull them apart again and turn them into snot. Um, if you want to cook and you don't want to use heat, you can make ceviche, right? You take your fish, your tender, translucent, flaky fish, and just put it in lime juice, and it's going to denature as well, and it will cook without heat because you're denaturing the protein. It's the same difference. And once a protein has been denatured, it's irreversible, correct? Yeah, it's usually irreversible. Um, what's another way you can denature a protein? We're not going to see it in our class as much, but think about an egg white. If you have egg whites, what's another way to tangle up those little albumins so they are now a big solid mass? I was going to say light, but I don't know if that's right. No. Like whipping them up? Sure. Mechanical? Me mechanical. And when you're making meringue, when you're making meringue, you are basically whacking those little things and they're like stretching and coming back, stretching, but they're stretching and opening up and then getting tangled up with each other. And before you know it, they're all tangled up with each other and denatured. So you can denature proteins by mechanically bashing them as well. Um, but this is a big reason why Temperature homeostasis, pH homeostasis is so important in your body. Like the proteins are going to denature if the heat or the pH is not in the range that the proteins are um, optimally working in. So, and again, what happens to an enzyme if you denature it? The binding site well, it won't work. Yeah, that binding site will no longer bind the substrate and then the enzyme no longer does its job. So it's really, you know, so denaturing an enzyme is going to kind of mess up the active site. And if it can't bind a substrate, it's not going to drive the chemical reactions and you're in trouble. So let's uh, move on. See, lipids. So lipids. Lipids are also made up of carbons, hydrogens, and oxygens like, like the carbohydrates were, but in a very different proportion. So way more of the H's and O's than C's. So like a classic, um, a classic fatty acid is like a carboxyl um, what am I doing here? <laughs> My God, I'm spazzing here, blah, 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 blah. Connected to these big hydrocarbon tails. So is the think. are the ratios consistent for all different types of lipids the way they are for no no okay. no it's yeah different lipids are going to have longer tails or shorter tails the only thing that's consistent is there's um 
so actually I, not, not way more o's way more c's and h's i just hold on kind of feel i should let me erase this That's what I meant to say. So lipids, lipids are gonna be C's and H's and O's like carbohydrates, but you're gonna have way more C's and H's than O's instead of having that nice little ratio that we saw in, in carbohydrates. Because you have these big long hydrocarbon tails. Um, in general, as a class, Something we should know is lipids tend to be nonpolar. So that is going to be something that is going to be important. If we say something is a lipid, like we're going to talk about cholesterol is a lipid, I don't really care if you know the interlocking ring structure of cholesterol, but I do care that you know it's a lipid and then it's nonpolar and it doesn't dissolve in water. So lipids are nonpolar. Let's talk about the main lipids that you're gonna get to know. So these fatty acids can get connected up in kind of your classic triglycerides. Let's look at a triglyceride right now. So we start with a glycerol. which is basically an alcohol. And then we take three of these fatty acids. And they bond here and here. So we're going to end up having this kind of glycerol here and these fatty acid hydrocarbon tails. So this is your classic triglyceride. Um, these are what we call fats. When we talk about what is you know fat, fat is just this thing. And you know there are different kinds of fats because there's different kinds of fatty acids. Um, I should probably talk about the idea of saturated versus unsaturated fatty acids. Um, if I have this tail coming down, And every carbon has as many hydrogens as possible that can go on it. We say this is fully saturated. Um, when the fatty acid tail is fully saturated, it tends to be straight. That actually makes a difference. It, it's going to have this, since everything is just kind of lined up, it's straight. If you have double bonds instead, and again, there's going to be two other things coming off this thing. If I have my carbon coming off, but then we have double bonds every once in a while, wherever there's a double bond, I can't have a hydrogen because there's only four, you know, four bonds off of each carbon. Right, so this is going to be unsaturated here. Because you don't have the total maximum number of hydrogens that you could have on there. And it means you have these double bonds between the carbons. 
And wherever you have the double bond, it kinks things. So if I am just kind of in this more loosey-goosey way drawing saturated fats versus unsaturated fats, I could draw like saturated fats look like this. Unsaturated fats look like this. You know, they're, they're both triglycerides. They both have a glycerol as their kind of kind of top kind of organizing structure. They both have fatty acids connected up to give you these big hydrocarbon tails. But the saturated fats have as many hydrogens as possible, and it makes the fatty acid tails straight. Unsaturated fats, the fatty acids have double bonds, which makes the tails kinked up and bent. Um, this has a lot to do with their um, properties. If you have straight tails, these things will kind of pack nicely. If you just let them put them together, these tend to be solid at room temperature. These unsaturated fats, they don't pack so well. These tend to be liquid at room temperature. Um, what's another word for these unsaturated fats that are liquid at room temperature? Oils. Yeah, these are oils. Oils are just the same thing as fats, except they're usually unsaturated and they don't solidify. Like You can have polyunsaturated where there's many points of unsaturation, so they're rarely kinked up tails. If there's just one point of unsaturation, then it's a monounsaturated fat. Right, a monounsaturated fat has like kind of one kink in it. It's not as extreme as a polyunsaturated fat. So things like olive oil are monounsaturated. They're still liquid at room temperature, but you put them in the refrigerator and cool them down a bit, they're going to solidify. Whereas if you take like safflower oil and put it in the refrigerator, it just stays liquid. Um, Animals tend to have saturated fats. Plants tend to use unsaturated fats as a rule. Um, I can mention briefly the idea of hydrogenation and trans fats while we're here. So hydrogenation is the idea of trying to slam more hydrogens and straighten out the tails on the fatty acid tails. So for instance, peanut butter, think about peanut butter. You take peanut butter, you grind up the peanuts, and the peanuts have oil. And if you are just getting some natural peanut butter, it's a pain in your butt because there's the peanut meal and then there's the oil. And it's like, okay, I wanna make a peanut butter and jelly sandwich. I gotta mix them back up. So, and actually, I'll talk, Back, at least when I was a kid, there was this idea, right? We actually do know that in general, unsaturated fats tend to, in your diet tend to be correlated with better cardiovascular health than eating lots of saturated fats. So people had this bright idea, let's take like corn oil or safflower oil and hydrogenate it, which and if, if you straighten out the tails, then it becomes solid. So that's when you get margarine. What is margarine? Margarine is just an oil where you have slapped a bunch of hydrogens onto it. So it's now acting more like a saturated fat. Um, you know, so when you hydrogenate, 
it's going to turn an oil into a solid thing. Right, that's why like Skippy and Jif don't separate because the fats are solid. Um, it also like less, you know, more stable. Um, those points of unsat unsaturation tend to be places where things break down more and the oils are gonna go rancid. Um, but what happened, what I can, yeah, just as a brief little aside, what happened when people did this, they thought they were doing something really cool, like, oh, we're taking this and making a healthier version of butter for people to make margarine. They ended up actually not doing what they thought because they made what they call trans fats. So if you remember, Right, I can like bend, if I have these things, I can bend them in different ways. I can have the same things bonded together, but if I'm bent in a way that goes like this, that's called trans. If I'm bent in a way like this, it's called cis. So what they found that when they were hydrogenating these fats, making margarine and stuff, that they were bending these fatty acid tails in these kind of unique ways to create these tails that the body had never seen before. So you ended up getting these fats with these bends in their tails and the body's enzyme systems were like, what the heck is that? Did not have the kind of metabolic pathways to effectively break this down. And it turned out that they ended up being less healthy than if you were just eating butter, right? So they found that these trans fats were actually not actually helping you. They were actually, it would be better just to eat butter than this margarine, which was creating these trans fats. So I think at this point they had figured out how to do this process without creating the unhealthy trans fats. Um, but that was kind of a big, a big thing for a while was when they started realizing that, oh, yes, in general, unsaturated fats are healthier than saturated fats for cardiovascular health, but not if you're artificially creating them and making these versions that the body is not used to seeing just in the normal diet. So, so that, was, that was kind of interesting. Um, any questions about that? All right, so triglycerides are your main kinds of fats in your body. Um, cholesterol is another important lipid. Maybe I should, so lipids. There's triglycerides. Or the oils and fats. And again, the only difference between an oil and a fat is how unsaturated or saturated the fats, the fatty acids are, and whether it's solid or liquid at room temperature. Um, cholesterol is another important lipid. Um, don't worry about the structure. It's got like these four interlocking carbon rings. Um, you should just know that cholesterol is a lipid and things that are derived from cholesterol are lipids. So like cholesterol is going to be an important part of cell membranes. We're going to meet it in just a few moments. Cholesterol also is what you make steroids from. So the steroid hormones are derived from cholesterol, things like estrogen and progesterone and testosterone and aldosterone. Um, so whenever you see a steroid hormone, it's important to remember, oh, steroids come from cholesterol, oh, which are lipids, which are nonpolar. So when we talk about steroid hormones later in the semester, you know, hormones travel through the bloodstream to send messages. But if you are a nonpolar molecule, that's tricky to be going through the bloodstream to take your message because you don't dissolve in water. So steroid hormones are gonna need special carriers 
that they can complex with to become overall non, you know, overall a polar structure that actually dissolves in the plasma. So again, that's why I'm saying, I don't care if you know what the actual formula of a cholesterol molecule or steroid hormone looks like, but I do care that you know there are lipids and that as lipids, they are nonpolar and therefore are gonna have a tricky time dissolving and are gonna need special help to move around in the body. Just kind of showing again, reiterating this idea, saturated fatty acid, again, this little carboxyl here, and then this big long hydrocarbon tail that has a full complement. It's saturated with hydrogens. It's got as many hydrogens on there as is theoretically possible. And that creates these big long straight tails. An unsaturated fatty acid is when there's a double bond between two of the carbons in the tail and it causes this kink, this bend. Um, like, so here's an example of, and here this is showing a triglyceride, a saturated fat. Again, this thing up at the top is the glycerol that is anchoring it all. The fatty acid tails all hanging out in line. That's kind of butter. Those are animal fats. Um, here we have our thing of oil. Here you can see an unsaturated fat or an oil has these double bonds, so these kinked tails. And so this, this is a better, <laughs> instead of my little goofy pictures of little crooked lines, this is a bit more of a formal illustration of a saturated versus an unsaturated fat. Um, so just to give you a sense of what that actually looks like there. And then I can tell you where we're gonna go next. The last thing we need to look at in terms of our lipids is instead of having this third fatty acid here, we can actually take this third docking point on the, on the glycerol and we're gonna attach this polar group, it's like phosphoric acid, it's gonna be a polar group at the top. So we're gonna have these tails that are gonna be hydrophobic, the hydrophobic oh, right. tails, but then we're also gonna have this polar head hanging off of this thing. So let's look at that in more detail now and see how that's gonna look. It'll be our last super important of the molecules that fits into the lipid heading. So phospholipids. Again, phospholipids, it's going to have these fatty acid hydrocarbon tails, which we're going to call like our hydrophobic or nonpolar tails. Then we're going to have this polar head, polar or hydrophilic. So this thing is a little more complicated. This is what we call an amphipathic molecule. Hydrophobic. You know, kind of like an amphibian kind of lives in the water and lives on the land. It's got kind of a foot in both worlds. This thing has a foot in both worlds of hydrophilic or polar as well as hydrophobic or nonpolar. Um, and again, you've met these before in your general biology. These are the main component that makes up your cell membrane. When you put these in water, they will automatically self-assemble. You don't have to do anything. You just have to shake them up and let them go. The polar head groups are gonna to orient towards the water, which is polar. The hydrophobic tails are gonna be moving away from the water and kind of going against each other. And you're gonna end up 
with your classic phospholipid bilayer. So again, the water molecules are going to be on either side of this thing. And the tails are going to all be kind of creating this hydrophobic zone, nonpolar zone in here. And again, this just self-assembles. You don't got to do anything to make it happen. It just automatically happens. Um, in fact, if I let me go into a PowerPoint from, is it in, hold on, let me see if it's on this one. Give me a second. Blah, 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 la, la. Yeah, here we go. All right, I'm going to go and share this right here. Share. This is just one of the PowerPoint illustrations from the things that I shared on the Canvas thing. Here you can see the circle is representing the polar head of a phospholipid. The little lines are those lipid tails, the, the hydrophobic tails. And you can see they just assemble into this big bilayer with the heads facing towards the water, either outside of the cell or inside the cell, and the tails creating this mm -hmm. kind of hydrophobic zone in between. Um, things to remember here. One is you know, the phospholipids that make up your cell membrane are not like chemically bonded together. They're just holding together due to the hydrophobic hydrophilic interactions, which means that they can shift with respect to each other. Like one particular phospholipid does not care if it's, you know, next to another specific phospholipid. They are constantly kind of shifting around, which is why we have this term of the fluid mosaic model. Fluid because each of these little phospholipids can shift and kind of move around. They always stay in the bilayer, but they can flow around from one place to another within that sea of phospholipid. Is it collagen that keeps, mostly keeps it together? No, collagen is nothing. There's no collagen in this picture. Hmm. Collagen is a fibrous protein that would be found as a structural thing. It's, it's, not, it's not in this. I thought there was some sort of percentage of... There's, there's sorry, I don't know where the... Cholesterol, that's what it is. Thank you. <laughs> so in a cell membrane, you have... Remember, cholesterol is fully hydrophobic. It inserts itself in the tails here. So you can see there's little bits of cholesterol that are kind of jammed in. Um, the more cholesterol that gets jammed in, the more um, kind of stiff things get, the less fluid it is. So in general, like water, in fact, we're gonna talk about membrane permeability in just a sec. In general, if you have more cholesterol, things are more kind of jammed, it's kind of less likely that something's gonna blast through one side to the other. Um, this fluid model, because things are shifting, fluid mosaic model, because in addition to the phospholipids, you got other stuff as well. There's a lot of these membrane proteins. Like this thing here is a transmembrane protein. It goes all the way across. Some of the membrane proteins just kind of go part way. But when we look at cell membranes in more detail on Tuesday, we'll be spending probably the entire day just talking about different types of proteins that you find in the membrane and the different roles they play. Um, these also are kind of staying in place with hydrophobic hydrophilic interactions. Remember I talked about some amino acids are nonpolar. You know, the part of this 
transmembrane protein that is within the membrane is going to have to be nonpolar because that's why it stays there. The top part and the bottom part, these are going to have to be have amino acids that are polar. So the top and the bottom want to stay towards the water side. So if you try to push this down, this polar is going to pull it back up. If you try to pull it up too far, though, this is going to pull it down. So it's going to stay in place just due to its polar nonpolar interactions again. So this thing can drift through the membrane and go different places as well. This is showing a more detailed view of what a transmembrane protein. Here we have alpha helices. And we look at the classic second messenger um, receptor in a G protein associated receptor in a little bit. We'll see there are these seven transmembrane helices that go up and down through the membrane. Um, and again, it's going to be important that this region is nonpolar. So this part of the protein stays inside the span of here, whereas the top and the bottom are going to be more polar. So they're going to be um, attracted and want to stay near the water. So this is the fluid mosaic model of membranes. This should not be new. This is stuff you definitely did in Bio 110. Um, what we're going to do in this class is go way more into detail about the properties of this membrane and the different roles that all these little proteins are playing within the membrane. So, so make sure, though, this basic idea of the phospholipid bilayer makes sense. A um, couple other things we can mention in the context of this. So the phospholipid, um, what is the, the classic phospholipid that's making up your cells is phosphatidylcholine, or one, one of the important ones, I should say. Does anybody know the, um, the common name for phosphatidylcholine? You can, you can just go to a store and buy it in a little, little capsules if you want. This is lecithin, right? If you take a little capsule of lecithin and crack it open, it's just gonna be this greasy stuff in there. Um, and again, if you take phosphatidylcholine and you just um, shake it up in water, it's gonna automatically form into, what we call these little vesicles where they are just gonna assemble so again, you don't have to, you know, and if you have a cell and you're doing like some kind of endocytosis where it pinches off, right? The membrane just automatically self heals, right? Because the phospholipids wanna just form back into their sheet automatically. Um, detergents are also, remember I said this term, amphipathic molecule. Detergents are also like that. Like when we look at bile, which is going to help with digesting fats, it's going to be have a nonpolar part. Or bile salts, it's going to have a polar part. So if I have a fat, let's say this is a fat. Normally, it's not going to dissolve in water because it's nonpolar. But if I have a whole bunch of these little detergent molecules, the tails are gonna to go towards the fat. The heads are gonna be out towards the water. I can tell, I'm sorry. The heads are gonna be out towards the, the water. So they surround this thing. We call this emulsifying. It basically, now this little fat drop is kind of independent and can float around in the water without having to glom onto another fat molecule, a fat, fat glob, I shouldn't say molecule. So I could have another glob of fat over here, and it's also kind of isolated by a little circle of these little detergent molecules. Well, this is like what happens with 
like dish soap, right? Like you're it's exactly right. If you have a greasy plate and you put it under the running water, the water just goes over the grease like a duck's back. But when you use soap, a detergent, that that's that this this amphipathic, that's the detergent. And it gets around the little fat drops and allows them now to basically go into the water and travel down, down the drain, rather than just stay like, I have nothing to do with the water, right? Now the little fat glob is something that can float around and swim around in the water. So you're saying though, like I, I get the um, the soap, but so on a molecular level, the way this works is it like surrounds those fat molecules to make, to help them get through the membrane. Um, sort of? it, no, it surrounds them to allow it to float around in the water without glomming back together, right? If you take, we'll talk about this more in digestion. Let's say I have, here's a big thing of oil, you know, and I'm just in water. The oil, and I, and I shake it up. You've done, if you've ever shaken up oil and water, oil and vinegar, you're making some dressing, you shake it up into little drops. Before you know it, it's back in one big drop, right? Like oil and water separate. But if you take that oil and the water and you shake it up with some emulsifier, some amphipathic molecule or some detergent around, then as it breaks apart into the little drops, those little drops are gonna get isolated and now each one is happy just floating in the water on its own. So it's not going to just glom back into one big oil oil glob. Does that, that, that make sense? Yeah, I, I, I get that. I was just wondering if like uh, talking about cell membranes, if this, if oh. this sort of process happens to help fats get through the membrane. So, yeah, but so it is, it is. So it exact, when we get to, um, breakdown and absorption of fats, the fat breakdown products are going to be surrounded by little um, little um, amphipathic molecules, which are going to create, they're called little micelles and help them move across. So it's, cool. yeah, it's totally what's going to happen. Got it. I was just trying to tie the soap example to like that, the membrane that we were talking about. I was like, okay, yeah. so that's probably how they're going to get through there. And, and, th and that's how they are going to actually even get up to the membrane without just going back into being a big glob. Um, so the last thing I will say before we just leave this, let's talk about membrane permeability. So again, the cell membrane which is made out of all these little phospholipids. You know, it's defining that's what's the outside world and what's the inside of your cell. So it's really important that we understand what crosses, what needs help to cross. So in general, if I have a polar molecule, some kind of thing, whatever it is, can it cross the membrane without any help in general? Uh, no, because it'll get stuck in the non, it'll get pushed out of the non-polar center. Yeah, so remember outside is all this H2O, right? The polar solvent, the, if I am some polar thing, in fact, I can use my, I can do this, yeah. I mean, oh, that's not what I meant to do. I want it to move. Ack. There, now it's moving. Hi, oh, silly goose thing. There. It's moving around. It's getting up to this non-polar. It's like, ooh, that's so not interesting at all. It's like, here's where the action is, where all the polar water molecules, I like this, gets up to the membrane again. It's like, ooh, there's nothing there that's interesting that's attracting me and I'm totally getting attracted back to all the polar stuff. So if you are a polar molecule, you are not going to cross the membrane naturally. 
without help. We're gonna see there's all sorts of special transport proteins that will help you move things in and out of the cell that are polar. So in general, in general, nonpolar molecules do not cross membrane without help. Like sugar. I thought we were talking about polar molecules. Oh, I yes. think you said yeah. polar. I, I thank you for catching me there because I totally spazzed. Um, yeah, in general, polar molecules do not cross. So glucose, glucose, which we've talked a bunch about, is glucose polar or nonpolar? Nonpolar. Nonpolar. Polar. polar. Right. That's Remember? what I meant. <laughs> right. So kind of, yeah, no, I got to give you slack because I wrote, I, I, I spazzed there too. Uh, so it, glucose is totally polar, right? We talked about glucose. It's got a couple of things. One is it's got that oxygen, which is lone pair electrons, which is always a sign of polar. It's got like these hydroxyls hanging off the carbons. And a hydroxyl is just an oxygen and a hydrogen, and the oxygens are lone pairs. So whenever you see a sugar, it's got lots of local charge imbalance around the hydroxyls and the oxygen and stuff like that. So glucose is totally polar, which means glucose does not cross the membrane without help. We're going to have special membrane proteins, these glucose transport proteins that allow glucose to cross the, obviously cells need to take glucose in or else they're not gonna have energy, but it's not gonna just come in without help. Um, there is an exception to this general rule. I said in general, you know, except, really small polar molecules can usually. So if this wasn't true, there would be no osmosis, right? Osmosis works because we talk about the water crossing the membrane. So the thinking, what people think is going on with water crossing the membrane is, you know, an H2O is zipping around, you know, and it's, let's say it's going really fast this way. You know, theoretically, there's nothing interesting in the cell membrane and it wants to keep dancing with its other polar water molecules by it, but it's so small and fast that it's like a bullet. It's like, it's getting close here. And by the time it realizes, oh, there's nothing here, I'd rather be there, it's boop, it's already on the other side. So if you're really small, then you have this really high speed and you zip through and you're on the other side before you even realize that you didn't wanna be there, right? Running, 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 it's like, whoa, where am I? This isn't where I wanna be. It's like, boom, okay, whoa, now I'm on the other side already. So, so specifically like water. This is why osmosis is gonna be happening because water molecules actually in general can freely cross the membrane. Um, there are cases where it can't so much, like there are special cells that are trying to really control water movement those are ones where there's a whole lot of cholesterol really stiffening up the membrane, making it really hard to wiggle in between. So, but in general, like water will cross the membrane. Also like in our lab next, I think next week, we're gonna be seeing, um, you know, also you know, things like urea. That's another really small thing. 
that is going to actually show up. I'm putting it in here specifically because we're going to see it in our lab next week. So when you see urea and think about its ability to penetrate a membrane, it actually can penetrate because it's polar, but it's dinky enough that it manages to blast through. But in general, so you know, large polar do not penetrate. Very small polar usually can. For instance, water molecules. And also we're gonna see urea. Um, what about nonpolar molecules? I'm going to guess that they can penetrate then. Yeah, so. exactly. Assuming you can get up to there. Obviously, they have to make it to the membrane. Usually, they're on some kind of carrier. But once you get up to the membrane, if you're nonpolar, doobie doo, you just drift across, right? There's no, a nonpolar molecule is not being attracted to staying on the one side or the other because it has no attraction to the water molecules. So it's just going to drift across the membrane. So nonpolar molecules can penetrate, can cross the membrane without any kind of help at all. So this, this is going to be important when we talk about different kinds of hormones or drugs. You know, things that are polar are going to need help to cross the membrane in general. Things that are nonpolar, they might need help getting up to the membrane because they don't dissolve like in the plasma. They need like special carrier molecules. But once they get to the membrane, they can just cross the membrane without any trouble. So does that make sense? You know, we're going to be spending, we're going to spend a lot of the next couple of weeks looking more in detail at the membrane and looking at all of the details going on at the membrane. It's obviously a really important place to pay attention to because it's controlling the boundary of what is you and what is the rest of the universe. So we're going to spend time looking at the more nuanced um, properties and how it affects you know, human physiology. Um, I could, just as a wrap, okay, there's, should mention there's combos. Um, sometimes we have proteins with carbohydrates together. So we have what are called, these are gonna be really common, are gonna be glycoproteins. In fact, most of those membrane proteins aren't just proteins in and of themselves. They're like proteins, and then they got little sugar groups hanging off of them. So that's a glycoprotein. It's a protein but then it has sugar groups hanging off of it. That's glyco is sugar. Um, if it's mainly sugar with some amino acid groups hanging out, it might be called a proteoglycan. The same base, it's also protein and carbohydrate, but the, the ratio is different. It's more, carbohydrate with protein versus mainly a protein with some carbohydrate. Um, another really common thing we're gonna see are 
um, lipoproteins. This is going to be the main way that we carry fats around in our body. There's going to be like lipid, lipid, and protein. Right, and so the part that is facing the water is protein, which dissolves. So this is kind of like a package that carries fats around in water, right? You know, at the core of it is lipid, but the lipid is not actually needing to dissolve because it's held in there. And, and so this is a way we're gonna transport fats around in the body is assembled into these lipoproteins. Um, other things, there's going to be glycolipids. Which are basically, um, and there's going to be lipo, yeah, so there, there's going to be all sorts of stuff. So, so just keep in mind that it's not always just a carbohydrate or a fat or, or a protein. It can be some Frankenstein thing. What did you say the proteoglycan was? Was that a protein it's, with amino acids? Is that what you said? It's so proteins always have amino acids. It's like a kind of more of a carbohydrate as the main structure, but with amino acids also tacked on as part of the structure. Those are like in the cell walls of bacteria and stuff like that. A lot of antibacterial things, antimicrobial things attack the proteoglycan wall of bacteria. Um, so just kind of putting that out there, we're gonna be meeting lots of things. Like when we, in fact, when you look at a cell with its fluid mosaic model, I talked about how you have all these membrane proteins They are actually typically um, glycoproteins. So they actually have these little sugar groups that are kind of hanging out. So if you're coming in, maybe you're in a fantastic journey in your little submarine with Raquel Welch or something, and you're going to go check in, what's this cell look like? what you typically see is all of these sugar groups kind of looking out at you. Um, sometimes they call it the glycocalyx. Glyco meaning sugar, calyx means kind of like the husk. It's kind of like there's a sugar coating on the cell. Right, because you have all of these sugar groups hanging off of the membrane proteins. So, um, so we'll we'll get back to that. That's you know part of part of when we get to cell ID and things like that. Um, okay, I realize there's just two more words that I meant to say earlier, but you should you should know these words, and then we can just say we're done with chemistry review. Endergonic. Ergonic. These are reactions, I should say. Chemical reactions. This means use needs energy to run. This gives off energy. So like the classic exergonic reaction is, you know, ATP breaking apart into ADP plus phosphate plus energy. You know, so some things, when you run the reaction, it releases energy. But then there's a lot of other things that need energy. They're not gonna run on their own. So we're gonna see lots of examples in our class where these are kind of coupled together.
very often we're going to see the breakdown of ATP used to do some reaction that normally wouldn't run on its own that needs energy. So like when we want to reset the myosin heads and muscle contraction, we're going to couple that with by breaking down ATP, hydrolysis of ATP provides the energy and it's coupled with the resetting of the myosin head so we're ready for the next power stroke in the muscle contraction. Um, so we're gonna see a lot of examples where these exergonic reactions, you know, and again, very often it'll be breakdown of ATP is coupled to make something happen that needs energy. So just kind of putting that out there completeness.